We are ready to go. We are good to go. How's it going for everyone? Good? Busting. Busting, bursting. Busting, bursting. <laughs> bursting. Emotions flowing, everything flowing. It's, I can tell it's going well because yesterday when I was having uh, lunch with Elf, she was reminding me of a time back, I think it was in Noosa, where the idea came in where we, you know, how Jesus washed the feet of the apostles. I got there to Noosa and I and the messengers, we went around and we washed all, it was probably 40 some participants. 60 people were there. We washed the feet of all 60. We went around with with little buckets and water and rose petals. So they got this. They showed up in the beginning. The first thing they experienced of a week long retreat was showing up and getting their feet immersed. And we all went down and knelt down before them, and we all had towels. And and uh, you said that. You had tears coming, and one of your teardrops had landed on my bald head at the time. <laughs> and now, look. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, you've, you've heard of uh, some of you've heard of Miracle Bro. <laughs> this was elf, elf tears, elf tears. And then Jeffrey, on the way today, he got paired up with the Healing Touch, and. He was down and he was going through the process with Elf and he felt a, a little drop and it was an, he said, picked me up this morning, he said, I got an Elf tear uh, on my hair. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it was long. He'll show up by the end of the, the seven days with the long hair. <laughs> That's it. So, if anybody's got any need for hair, just <laughs> Elf will help you out. <laughs> I wish somebody would do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> oh. So, well, today we've just heard a, a bit of an update on the expression sessions and um, yeah there's a lot of things as you start to work with the course and you get deeper into it you're, you'll find that there's certain teachings that Jesus have in the course that that take a lot of willingness and a lot of determination over actually what will seem to be a lot of years before it starts to come you know over the horizon and into your awareness so uh, one of the, the concepts that Jesus talks about in the Course is the unhealed healer. It's very tempting to pick up this book with all this great metaphysical wisdom and to start to assimilate it like you would a human being and then go, hmm, I got the goods now. I, I, I can heal. And, and then you're looking around to try to find somebody to heal <laughs> with all this new metaphysical wisdom that you've got. And basically, the Course is saying that it takes, it takes a really full transfer of training to go from the unhealed healer, which is coming from a place of still seeing errors, uh, still see, seeing errors in people and the world, and thinking that you are there sent to offer the answers uh, because of this book that you've read. Uh, whereas Jesus is like, no, actually... Uh, to forgive, you have to get so aligned with the Holy Spirit in your mind that you don't see the error at all. You're just happy. You're just joyful. And that happiness and joy will be the inspiration that heals. <coughs> then when other people are around you, they will feel relaxed. They will feel like, wow, this person's really happy and they're not judging me. I can relax and be myself. And then that's how the healing occurs, when you feel relaxed. Because Generally, people like to be and gravitate towards happy people. And if you have a happy state of mind, then that will be a perfect uh, ignition of, of healing. 
In fact, that's the whole healing. When you when you're happy, the whole world is is healed along with you. When you're smiling, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. There it is. It's the Course in Miracles. <laughs> when you're happy, we're ready. she's ready for the next line, the next verse. And so that's that's one that's pretty common. I'm trying to think what else we covered. A true empathy is another one. People pleasing. True empathy is one that takes quite a while. When the mind is deluded, and when the mind's asleep and insane, it's, it's constantly looking outward at everything. So it's judging and evaluating everything. Even its own success, it will try to use externals to judge its success. And true empathy is just a state where, where you come and you join within to what is real and true. And that's where you find the happiness and the joy and the peace. And then you, you cease to be interested. You cease to care about appearances. Jesus even has a, a question that's posed to him in the Manual for Teachers. Should healing be repeated? And basically he's saying, if you get to the point where you pray and you join and you offer healing, and then you come to a point where you have a doubt thought in your mind, and you're not sure if the healing worked, you need to come back inside because it's your own mind where the doubt thought is. You should never be judging symptoms or judging appearances to see whether the healing worked. It's your state of mind. Your happiness, your joy, your glee is what the healing is. So if you're starting to look at symptoms or you're looking at, at how it's going for somebody, how are they doing, uh, then you've gotten out of true empathy, which is staying with the spirit, and you've gotten into false empathy. And of course a lot of us have come from that place where, you know, how, oh, how are you doing, you poor baby, you know, it's, we've come from a whole system of false empathy, where we've been taught that false empathy and concern is actually helpful. And Jesus is like, that's crazy. Continuing concern is worry? Do you think worry is helpful? <laughs> Where's your mind at when you're worrying? You know, when you're so concerned. So these are, are things that take a lot of practice, but it's good to talk about them openly so we can be aware of them. So when they come up, we can go, oh yeah, that's right. I just need to come back inside here. I don't need to try to figure anything out. I don't need to get caught into comparing or contrasting or, or watching the world, watching how things are going for other people. I need to just pay full attention to what my emotional state of mind is. And then use my emotional state of mind as my touchstone, as my barometer, as my reminder to come back, back inside. How does that feel different, true versus false empathy? How does that feel different? Well, true empathy is, is always happy and, and loving and joyful. And the false empathy, because it has the concern, the worry, the doubt with it, it's, that's where the word false comes in. It's not really empathy at all. It's, yeah, it could be sympathy and then um, even some of the, like the Buddhist teachings, like um, a lot of times in Buddhism they'll talk about compassion. And it's true compassion would be like true empathy. It's it's totally coming from love. False compassion would be compassion for the suffering of others, where you're perceiving the suffering, and then you're saying, "But I will have love for the suffering." And Jesus is saying, "Listen, if you're perceiving the suffering, you got a problem. You got a twisted, distorted perception that even perceives the suffering." Because if you're with me, all is well. You will be the light of the world. You will bring love and laughter and joy. And you, the most you'll see of suffering is like a call for love. Like, oh, oh, go extend love. It's not the sense of that somebody is worse off or somebody is less than. This whole perception of suffering gets into this idea of less than. Like someone is less than and someone has worse conditions. 
There's a great line in the Course where Jesus says, Beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. But I would even extend it to, Beware of the temptation to perceive anyone unfairly treated. Animals unfairly treated. People. Countries. As soon as you are perceiving mistreatment, you're perceiving victimization. What kind of a thought system is perceiving victimization? The ego. And where is the ego? In your own mind. So where does the victimization end? In my own mind. Where does the world hunger end? In my mind. <laughs> where does war end? In my mind. Where does sickness and suffering end? In my mind. Wow, that's helpful to be reminded of that because we want to empower our mind. We won't, don't want to disempower ourselves and set it up so we still believe that there's something outside of us that's causing harm, that's wreaking havoc. You know, this thing's out of control, that thing's out of control. You know, basically that's how the ego works with, with politics. Um, perceiving external terrorism. Where is the terrorist? Oh, if I'm perceiving terror, it's in my mind. I shouldn't be pointing the finger at, oh, there's a terrorist over in this country and there's a terrorist here. Jesus, every time I had, in the early years, the slightest thought of something that was gone wrong somewhere in the world, some place, some person, he would say, oh yeah, pointing the finger again. There's three fingers pointing back. You point the finger, David, and three fingers point back. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. All reminding you, <laughs> quit pointing the finger. <laughs> Take responsibility for your state of mind. Don't blame. Don't put the, the blame out on an external world when your mind is generating that, that guilt and that blame. And so, that's another thing that happens. You have to allow the emotions to come up, and as soon as those intense emotions come up, watch how fast the ego wants to look for blaming. Like, oh, we're at a farm. The farmer decides to cut the whole field of hay <laughs> right before, the day before, a seven-day retreat. The, whole, the farmer... Armor. It's a long, high field of hay, and it's just sliced down and boxed up, and people go, hmm. The ego's like, huh, ha, 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 ha. But you see, the, nothing happens by accident. We, we have called this upon for healing. We, we've called it upon to bring back causation to our mind, to look within and say, what's, what's disturbing me and irritating me inside that I'm not willing to look at, and then the ego's like, oh, it's out there. No, it's not. It's not out there. That is helpful the more you get into the habit of bringing it back and saying, hmm, what's under my skin? What's irritating me? What's annoying me? There are no small upsets. Any upset, no matter the degree of the upset, is, is taking away your peace of mind. You know, irritation and annoyance take away your peace of mind, just like rage does. And rage may seem more intense, but it's not any better or worse than irritation and annoyance. It's, it's equally upsetting. That's another training that we have to work with, with Jesus on, is that there are no small upsets. And sometimes we're, we're busy looking at the error, trying to look at the degree of the error. Uh, there is no degree of error. Error is error. And healing is healing, and it's going to take a, a full effort of, of willingness for us to go through that transformation of, of consciousness to come to say, oh, I'm ready to be wholly healed, not partially healed, because that will just live, leave a little more space for error if we're going for partial healing. There's all these games in the world where you get points for coming close, but salvation is not one of those games. <laughs> darts and horseshoes and you must have some Australian games down here, right? You get points for, you get bonus points for getting close. No? That's good. Archery. You get a point in footy. Rather than goal. Okay. Six points. Rather than six. Okay, is that Australian rules? Okay, very good. We have the same thing. 
in America. But not in, in reality, you know, there's no bonus points. The angels don't go, oh, great, so close. <laughs> you know, it's more, the call is go all the way. Go all the way for the, the peace. Jesus says in the Course, this Course will be believed entirely or not at all. I like that. I mean, I liked reading that. Oh, okay, give me, give me the fine print up front. I, I don't want to, you know, go through it and put in a lot of time and energy and then, what? <laughs> or what did you say, not at all? When I first read that line, I, I mentioned it in my study group and somebody at the study group said, now that's depressing. <laughs> and I said, I didn't think it was depressing. I just thought, not at all is not an option. <laughs> it's basically, I'm not here in this lifetime for a not at all <laughs> experience. That's what reincarnation is about, you know. Reincarnation is, so oh, okay, let's give it another go round and try it next time. I'm not really into future lifetimes either, you know. You know people say, well, you'll get it. You'll get it in your next lifetime. <laughs> um, no, that's not an option. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see what are some other topics people pleasing fear of love people pleasing the root of people pleasing is that when the mind seemed to separate from God it was very shaky about its new identity because its true identity is Christ so to take on an identity of flesh instead of spirit is a shaky proposition. It's a shady proposition. It's full of shadows. And there's an uncertainty. So with the persona, the mask, the personality is, is always shaky. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, come on, Toastmasters will train you to be good public speakers and be confident and be sure and be certain. But I'll guarantee you, there will you will never find a, a 100% confident person because the person is the mask. That would be like saying a 100% confident mask. <laughs> and Christ has no mask. And the whole point of here is to be demasked, to be unmasked. You know, I always remember that Jim Croce song, you know, you don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't spit into the wind, you don't pull the mask off the, own, the old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Slim. But uh, his whole point is, by the end, they, yeah, Slim is not to be messed with. He basically cuts up the, the bully in that uh, Jim Croce song. But, but actually the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, let's go ahead and pull the mask off the Lone Ranger. It was a, I don't know if you know the Lone Ranger down here, Tonto? No, the, the mask. Silver, hi-ho, silver, yes, the horse, yes. You, you, you do want to be demasked. You, no matter how confident you get at Toastmasters or Maybe you jump out of airplanes and then you say, get the stronger and stronger, and they walk on some hot coals. Ha, ha, ha. And you think you're pretty spiritual, you're the best you can be, you know, where you're so strong and confident. Jesus is like, no, actually, that's not what I want. I want the burst. I don't want, I don't want a fully human human. I want a spirit that knows itself as spirit. So this whole idea of self-improvement as a person, how much stress have we put ourselves under into trying to make ourselves a better person? Or be a better person? There's even a, a slogan, I remember all the catchy little jingles and slogans I've heard in my life, but for the United States Army, be all that you can be, I don't think so. I don't think a killing machine is, is all you can be. I think there's more. Than, than learning how to use rifle and drop bombs and shoot people. You know, you can be all that you can be. Jesus would say, yeah, be that you all that you are, is what he would say. Not can be, but that's future. And that's still this game of self-improvement. That's why they run us through so many years of education. They, we have to keep going and you get degrees and you have to get all this expertise and all this specialization. And then just when you're 40, 50 years old, you went, glad that's all over. 
They say, no, continuing education. <laughs> what? Well, you've got to keep your skills sharp. You've got to go back. Oh, come on. You know, it just goes on and on and on and on. You know? <laughs> they come up to Grandpa, 80 years old. You, have you done your continuing education? <laughs> Are you stretching? You know, Grandpa doesn't want to stretch. <laughs> Grandpa wants to sit in the chair. Don't stretch grandpa. You know, are we ever... I mean, when do you stop? When do you stop this self-improvement thing? You know, it's, just, it, it's a never-ending wheel, and, it, and that's where the people-pleasing comes in, because you're always trying to please someone if you, if you have a sense of insecurity or a sense of deep unworthiness then the ego says, well, prop that up a little bit. You know, get some friends, get some approval, get something outside of yourself that will prop up your shaky little self and make the best of a bad situation. It's basically how the ego is going. And basically, Jesus is saying, no, you were created perfect and you are still perfect. You don't, can't improve upon perfection. You can't improve upon the way that you were created. So you might as well drop the mask, uh, and even drop the sense of trying to improve and make a better self. That's a relief. I think at some point, I, I think I was in my 20s where the way it came to me is, hmm, time to retire. I'm taking early retirement. <laughs> I think I was in my late 20s when the Course came to me, and, and that was the feeling I had wash over me after I read the Course. I was like, whoa. He's giving me permission to retire. Like Jesus says, I am calling you out of the world. I'm calling you to the kingdom of heaven within. I want you to retire from the world. Yes, take early retirement. At the time, I thought that meant an easy life, but it certainly doesn't feel easy when you're working through all the darkness. It feels like you've taken a graduate class in, in pain. Uh, because because it's been so repressed and denied and pushed out of awareness that when you take the lid off and say, okay, bring it up, then that's, that's when it starts. Yeah, and also why is that um, people-pleasing is something that we really emphasize a lot. You know, it's one of the only two rules that we live by as a community, you know. Why is that? Because it is such a um, assumed, like it's a, under, underlying way that we we operate in this world and gradually it becomes a default way of operating whether we talk about it or not when we were in Asia when we were in Japan for the first time to talk about people pleasing was very confusing because people said that is good that is what we value you know even if we put it on the table to talk about people pleasing, that is something that you are taught to do. You you are to pe to please your family. You are to please the elders. You're ple here to please your boss. This is, you know, our culture. This is what is supposed to be a good human being. And even in the other other cultures, if if that is not overtly um, encouraged, that is still an underlying way of us, oper you know, the way we operate in this world. And yet, underneath it, underneath it, what is motivating this people-pleasing behavior is fear. What is motivating that is this littleness. It's not love. And a lot of the times when we talk about people pleasing, people confuse that with the behavior. Because we we tend to judge behavior as, is this people pleasing or is that people pleasing? If we say you shouldn't people pleasing, does that mean you don't do anything that is so-called loving at the behavior level? And that isn't really what we're talking about. We are talking about something as a motivation underneath because at the behavior level you can still be inspired to hug someone and to comfort someone when it is you know as um, inspiration from the spirit but you might as well do the very same behavior if it is just to you know please someone hide the resentment and hide the fear and hide the anger 
and try to push it down into awareness and put on a, a mask, a polite mask. So there is no real, um, we're not really talking about the level of behavior of how to judge a behavior and how to change behaviors. What we're really talking about is people pleasing is a motivation and this motivation is actually for hiding of what is truly underneath there is, is a distraction for us to get in touch of with the emotions that, it, that wants to come up in the present moment. And we behave instead, you know, in a way that we, we think is polite, or we think is a good human being, or we think this is the way of getting approval from other people. So that is what we are talking about. And people pleasing, you know, is always there because we assume I am a person and what I'm talking to or involved with is a person. That is underneath assumption. Otherwise, there is no even need to people, please. Underneath assumption is a big assumption. We are human beings. We're individual, separate individuals. So I feel like, you know, if we don't people, please, then how does that look? Well, we spirit, please. <laughs> because what we are going to pull back our attention toward is the spirit. It's the spirit in my mind. You know, what is the spirit want me to, to see? What is the spirit want me to say? That becomes a focus. How to see the spirit in my brother instead of seeing this person as a suffering human being that needs my help. So that is the shift, the twit in the mind that we're going to make. And in, inevitably, every single time when, when the focus is pulled back from um, pleasing a person who I think I know and has a human history, to how do I um, in, be in alignment with the spirit, it's always an experience of feeling the peace and feeling the love and feeling the uplifting sense. And then you can just always feel a deep, deeper sense of a connection with the people that you actually joined in. Because I have just have so many experiences with, you know, different ones and especially with my mother over the years. You know, this is uh, people pleasing is a, is a very thick dynamic that is expected in in the family uh, construct and in the culture. And just by me turning away from trying to fulfill a, a role with her and the expectation and to allow the spirit to guide me, there are just countless miracles that, that I experienced for myself, but also I witness in her how that actually not only benefit myself but put her into something that's much deeper than what she is actually calling for as a spirit herself wanting to know her true self. You know, she might crying for, oh, you are doing something so radical, you don't, you're selfish, you don't think about me, but every single time when I don't compromise, she actually pops through and goes deeper in her mind, and we can connect at a much deeper level, you know, rise above the roles that we gave ourselves. So that is something that we can do to benefit ourselves, but also the whole universe. It is so huge, this, this no people-pleasing and true empathy. They're very closely connected, these two concepts. Yeah. I'd say a synonym for people-pleasing is codependency. It's just another word. So if you say, well, people-pleasing, I don't know if I completely relate to it. Codependency, we've heard that. And, you know, you may say, well, with my experiences on planet Earth, you can say, well, um, in partnerships, a lot of times, there's this thing people call an economic factor. You know, who's the breadwinner of the family? Who's who's bringing in the income. Oftentimes, the one who's not bringing in the income will people please the one who is bringing in the income. Things have changed over the decades. It used to be, a lot of times it was men, but now it's flipped around. A lot of times the women. Woman is the breadwinner and there's people pleasing. It can go any angle. 
but it always can come from a, a sense of inferiority. Like there's a pressure. I've got to please the partner to keep the partner. And why do I want to keep the partner? Because I'm dependent on the partner for what? For survival, for emotional things. You know, you see how the ego is set it up that you're not whole and complete, and you need people to prop up the mask. So it's not enough to have just a mask of a person. You need a lot of other people to prop up this insecurity. And then people can say, well, what about like when you're a child, you know, if you're four years old, you're, you're going to people please mom. Uh, mom runs the show usually <laughs> at four. You've got a little bitty body and mom's got a big body and dad's got a big body and you know, and you can say all oh, these people pleasing tendencies go back to childhood because I was just a child. I, my way or the highway, you know, you start, even as a teenager, you start to assert a little bit of autonomy, my way or the highway. You play by my rules or you're out. Mm -hmm. Some of us in the community, like Kirsten, I think she left, tried to leave at 13, by 15 she left school and she was out. Mm -hmm. Just left because there was a sense of, I'm not playing by those rules, I'm gonna play by a different set of rules. But that people-pleasing is set up by the mind. Before you even seem to come to this world, there's insecurities, there's fears. Before you seem to manifest as a person, the mind is already believing in the ego. If you were identified with the spirit, you wouldn't come to this world. Why would you go from truth to illusion if you're already in truth? You must believe in illusions to come to time and space, or to seem to come into time and space. So it's already in the mind. There's all this inferior, superior stuff going on in the mind. There's all this, I'm not good enough. There's all this unworthiness. And basically, you come to planet Earth or you come to time and space because my synonym for this world is distractionville. Uh, you, you're coming because you don't want to know who you are. If, if you knew who you were, you wouldn't come at all. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't come again, <laughs> for sure. There's somebody down here, I think AJ and Mary, some of you have heard of, and the reincarnation of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It's like, why would Jesus reincarnate? <laughs> There's no point. <laughs> if you're the one, <laughs> you don't need to reincarnate. If, if uh, Neo is the one too, you don't need Matrix 2 and Matrix 3, right? <laughs> That's just sequels to make money for the Wachowski brothers uh, and Warner brothers. That, you know, Everybody knows one was all you needed. Everyone's like, what the heck is Neo getting involved with here in number two and three? But that's the whole point. If, if you believe you're not who you are, then you will set up a world of all kinds of crazy uh, interactions that are just there to reflect that you're not whole and complete. In fact, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus uses the word people which for most of us is a noun, he uses it as a verb in the Course. He said, the ego peopled the world. A verb? Talk about should. The, the ego has peopled the world. The ego has projected out a bunch of bodies that are not whole and complete, that are going to act out insecurities and doubts, and then the wonder there's problems in interpersonal relationships because the ego peopled the world. The ego put the bodies there and dumps the guilt onto the bodies. And so you seem to fall in love with the body and then things go good for a while and then all of a sudden things start to go bad. And then they go really bad and then you hate them. <laughs> it starts off lovey-dovey-dovey all the time and it goes to, don't ever speak to me again, ever. <laughs> I never want to see your face again. You know, you see, whoo, the love has gone somewhere, <laughs> or was it even there? But if the ego peoples the world, then all of these cultures, all of these relationships, and everything that everyone's struggling with is because the ego set it up. And now you're being asked to come inside. Nirvana, kingdom of heaven is within. Come inside, come into your truth. Yes? Well, just came to my mind. You made a comment about why would uh, Jesus wants to reincarnate? Perfectly right, because once you are nirvana realized, 
you don't want to, you, you, you don't come back as a body. However, the term given in Vedanta is when God does come in the form of a body, is incarnation, which is the avatar. I think most of us have now heard this word, avatar. So, avatar is when, bod- when God decides to take the form of a normal body to spread the good in his message, when that message is, is, is not spreaded around enough. For example, I could see you as, David, as the avatar of Jesus. Because what you are preaching is Jesus' love to all of us. And the, in, the, in Vedanta, they say that God does come from time to time, but, but the term used for that is avatar, the incarnation but not reincarnation, because there is a purpose behind Jesus taking the form of a human being to be with the human beings to spread that love, which somehow over a period of time disappears. So seriously, sitting here, when you're talking like that, you are the Jesus avatar. Well, I can mention in the course that basically it starts off with this thing. It, he's, he goes back to what the Bible says. It says, it says, in the beginning, the Word is capitalized. In the beginning, the Word was made flesh. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus takes that line right from the Bible, and you think he might say, like, this is what's, what's, what's happening for, in a helpful way. And he says, strictly speaking, this is impossible. That's how he... He addresses it. So, again, what's so great about Jesus in the Course, he's always saying, bring the illusion to the truth. He's not even taking the, the best chance he's got in the beginning. I think you should all, already start to question when you hear the words, in the beginning. If, if everything is eternal, in the beginning, ooh, wait a minute, who's talking here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who's talking? The Word was made flesh. Ooh, it, so Spirit was made matter. Oh, how did that happen? How did you get eternal spirit? In it? And he says, strictly speaking, that's impossible because there are different levels. One is a realm of spiritual reality and one is that. In fact, he goes so far at one point to talk about the saints of God and, and he even says at one point, there are those that have laid the body aside in order to increase their helpfulness. Isn't that an interesting end? There are those who have laid the body aside in order to increase. Because from the realm of, of this, we think of healing the sick, raising the dead, speaking, laughing, shining. We think, that's good, good, good. You're doing good, good, good. But Jesus is like, well, actually, if you let it all go, I'll be more pleased. <laughs> You know, which is really what all the scriptures, the Vedanta, everyone's saying, release your attachment to form, release your attachment to the temporal, and accept the eternal. That's, that's what all the perennial wisdom teaches us throughout the, the centuries. So, so that's something to keep in mind, and I would say, I, I consider avatars and saints and mystics and everything, those are just helpful symbols because when we perceive them, there's something in our heart that, that is, is resonating. And it's saying, ah, oh, yes, thank you for reflecting, helping be a way shower, pointing the direction. In the end, of course, we, we have to let go of concepts of saints and avatars and, and enlightened people. Because what would enlightened people again be but enlightened mask? And would the mask ever be enlightened? No. <laughs> It's a block to the one. It's not an actual thing that, that is a realistic possibility. Yes, Peter. Yeah, sorry, did I, if, I might have missed something there. How, what would that look like, to lay the body to one side in order to be more helpful? I'm not sure if that means you died so that you were more helpful dead, or if that means you haven't, um, yeah, you've just given yourself fully to, you know, what does that look like, please? Yeah. Yeah, we've had old ideas about laying the body aside because we, we're used to when somebody dies and we see them in a casket or we throw them in the, in the ground and throw some dirt on them that they've laid the body aside. You could say laid the body and the world aside because the body is just perception and the world is just perception. Really the body is no different than the stars or the planets. It's certainly not made of anything different than the, the dust of this cosmos or the matter of this cosmos so what he's really saying is 
Go in your mind, have the burst, find the happy dream in which you don't judge anything. You just, all things are equally acceptable, all things work together for good. Find the sameness of everything, where you find joy with everything without exception. Find that happy dream, and then God will take the final step. In other words, you don't even have to be concerned what comes beyond that. If you make your mind ready for God by not judging anything, oh, it's not, a, it's not far at all back to remembrance of God, from a state of non-judgment. I think that the entire teachings of the New Testament and, and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, if you boil down the Sermon on the Mount to just two words, it would be, judge not. Not because you shouldn't, but because you can't. God didn't create us to be a judge in the first place. And that place of complete acceptance, complete non-judgment, complete open-mindedness, that's, that's making your mind ready to remember God. And that's where our focus is. We're not, the focus shouldn't even be on laying the body aside, uh, because that's more of like a, laying the world aside is like an outcome of forgiveness, where you simply have no need for it anymore. For a while you use the body as a communication device. Jesus says that's, that's the one use that the Spirit has for the body, is just as a communication device. But then, basically, there is one tiny part in the Course that I found it at one point where I couldn't believe I read the words, but I read it in there and I was like, oh my gosh. But Jesus says, the body has no purpose. All these other places, it's just, he's being practical. Communication device, you know. But then he says it has no purpose. Hmm. Of course, if it's not real, that's probably why <laughs> it doesn't have a purpose. You know, you can see how deep it goes, where, the, where you just let everything go. Come with open arms unto your God. You know, lay aside all thoughts. The thoughts of the body, the thoughts of perception, the thoughts of, of, of a happy... Even at the end, you let go of the happy dream. Who wants to keep dreaming? If there's something called awake, <laughs> you know, even happy dreams happily come to an end. Because you are the happiness. You actually are the spirit of happiness. And so even dreaming doesn't content the mind. Yes? When you just said this, when you made a comment on we shouldn't even believe the words in the beginning, because there is no beginning and no end. I've always thought of the separation, the moment of separation is happen happening sometime in the past, but there is no past. So are we constantly, like Groundhog Day, moment to moment, nanosecond to nanosecond, constantly rebirthing that concept of separation in our minds right now. We're giving birth to it. Right now is the beginning, if we had to put a label on a beginning. And the end is right now. Yeah, we probably the most profound expression I heard was Jesus told Helen Schuckman one time, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. Mm. Now that sends us all in a very interesting direction. You know, instead of looking, save the ozone layer and end pollution and end world nuclear armaments and everything, ooh, now we're going to focus our attention. If we're still making the same mistake in the present, let's put our attention on the present. Let's really come in and zoom in close and say, there's some kind of a sneaky deception going on where it's all right here for me. The whole joy of the kingdom of heaven is closer than breath, closer than breathing, closer than... He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's pretty close. But the kingdom of heaven is closer than a hand. Then let's start going into that. And isn't that a wonderful thing to use our mind's energy for, is to go zooming into the present. You know, when people call me, I mean, I, I was out traveling one time and I had my cell phone and I'm going around and, and some of you have heard or met our friend, Lisa, my friend Lisa Fair, but she called me on the phone. I answered the telephone. She, I never met her before, never heard from her. I answered the phone. I go, hello. She didn't even say hello. She didn't say hi. She didn't say, how are you? She didn't say, is this David? <laughs> she said, I want joy. That's what I got when I answered the phone. I answered the phone, I want joy. I said, great! I join you completely in that. You know, the Spirit's right there to respond. 
That's what we're going for. We really are going for a life of joy. And whatever this sneaky thing is that's keeping us from our present moment, we are determined to expose that. We are determined to not buy into that, not believe it anymore, not keep repeating like Groundhog Day these days over and over. Yes, Nicole. Well, you said earlier about um, when we stop. Um, you said earlier when we stop at judging, we um, come to that place where then God will pick us up. Um, does it mean judging? I stop judging because I understand, I see, or understand the level of this being illusionary, or does it mean even with my current state of understanding, I'm you're all looking pretty real to me, I'm quite convinced about the illusion at the moment um, but if I discipline my thought enough and even at this state of mind I stop judging then that will be enough for God to come and take me? Yeah, yeah it's really the same to, to all you have to do is quiet the mind, that's what the goal of meditation is, is to sink beneath the thoughts and reach that still point underneath. Mm. If you reach the still point then game over for the world and the ego. If you reach the still point by just training your mind not to judge, I would say instead of meditation, let's say you, you start to talk, we talk about guidance, and I say you can be guided through the day, every step of the way, without exception. It's a workbook lesson. God's voice speaks to me all through the day. Yeah. Now most human beings would say, yeah, I believe that, but I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I've got my own agenda where sometimes I tell God, yeah, hold it, pipe down a little bit there, I'm, I'm enjoying this too much, actually, I'm, later, when I've got a problem, we'll connect, uh, I'm, things are good now, but if we knew what was good, we wouldn't be putting God on hold, <laughs> if we really knew what was good for ourselves, we don't know our own best interests, but if, let's say, instead of meditation, you say, no, it's, it's too long, and I, I don't know, I, if I can't meditate, my mind's too distracted, but I am going to, practice hearing guidance and being intuitive and following that guidance and the Spirit will give you instructions which are still within the realm of words and judgments but it will take you to that leaping off point where you go ah got it you know this isn't my I'm not meant to be judging I always like the, the Sermon on the Mount and I like those two words judge not and then there's two more words that I think would summarize This was from the Gospel of Thomas. You know, most people know the Bible and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they did discover in the, the Middle East the Gospel of Thomas. And much of what Gary has written about, Gary Renard the, has written the, the Gospels of Thomas are very much in, in his books after disappearance. But in the Gospel of Thomas, they say Jesus' shortest teaching, not judge not, but the shortest teaching is two words. Be passers-by. Those are the two words. Be passers-by. That's what he wants you to do with this world. Be passers-by. Watch the world, but don't engage in it. Watch the images, but don't judge them, and don't, don't feel you have to fix them, change them, correct them, anything. Be passers-by. And he does, if you want an expanded version from the Course on Be Passers-By, if you go to Lesson 128 in the workbook, The world I see holds nothing that I want. Jesus has got a sentence early on. He says, the only value that this world holds for you is that you pass it by. <laughs> you know, he gets your attention with the first part of the sentence. And then he wipes it like the Zen mandala. He just wipes the sand away. Is that you pass it by? That's, that's the quickest way to happiness and joy. And, and you do this through guidance. You have to be practical. If, you, if the ego has wound you into debts and obligations and duties, you just pray to the Holy Spirit and say, unwind me from those. Because I'm, I'm being guilty feeling guilty because I'm so wound into false obligations and duty, unwind me out of those. And the Holy Spirit will do that in a very practical way. You will not abdicate, you know, you will not just try to push things away like and like the ostrich who puts the head in the sand, you know, and just buries the head in the sand to pretend the world's not there. You want the Holy Spirit to show you 
step by step that the world's an illusion. You know, take me, take me by the hand, unwind me, guide me, where do I go? Holy Spirit, what would you have me say? What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? That, that's the way my life has gone. It has not been a path of necessarily long, long, long hours of meditation, just sitting and trying to sink beneath the thoughts. It's been listen and follow. And I would say that for everyone in our community, that's, that's our pathway. We're here to listen and follow and follow the guidance and let the Spirit take us to that pristine state of mind. Can I, um, can I just ask another question to the expression sessions? Because you said when we feel we uh, go below and look what is below to get to belief, to change to true desire. Now, it turns out all the time, every time some emotion is there, something shitty is at the bottom, and every time I must change to desiring peace of God. Can I also, instead of going through all this process all the time, it's a bit, can be a bit much, you know, uh, um, can I just go like, oh, there is this thought again. This just means I'm not desiring peace of God. I don't want this. I change to desire peace of God. But it's not good enough. You have to go all the way, all the time, every time. Well, you can, people have asked me if it's, if it's a process or an instant. And actually, awakening is an instant. And also, do I have to go through all this darkness to find the light? Is there like a shortcut? And when I was talking the other night about cause and effect, that's the shortcut. You know, is to come to a realization that cause and effect are together and are not apart. Then the darkness is gone in that realization. But I think what you're saying too is, uh, is it possible for me to, to keep so focused on what is it that I want. And I think that there are pathways to God that, that are like that. I think when I think to, of Eastern pathways like India, when I think of Ramana Maharshi, he basically said that there was one question you should always ask yourself. Who am I? That's like the core issue. It's every single question, every single thought, every single belief is really a question of identity. But most people find that too difficult. Imagine like you go through your day and you're supposed to practice who am I thousands of times. You know, you're in the middle of singing a song. Who am I? You know, it's, you know it seems impractical, the who am I question. And, and so with A Course in Miracles, Jesus has designed a system where he gives you, he gives you the the, the text as like a theoretical basis, so, so your mind is kind of oriented in what's going on. Is, or more oriented to let go of thinking you know what's going on, because <laughs> you don't have a clue, really is what the, the text is teaching us. Then it gives us a workbook, so we have one lesson a day to practice with our eyes open, usually moving through our daily activities. And he throws in, in the middle of the workbook, he, has a, uh, he says, It is possible to listen to the voice for God all through the day without interrupting your regular activities. Oh my God! <laughs> that doesn't sound like eyes closed meditation. He's telling us it's actually possible to go through the day listening only to the voice for God without interrupting your regular activities in any way. That's amazing. That's like, what, what a pathway. For most of us who have been raised in Western cultures, and we have many busy doings. We have jobs, there's relationships, there's family, there's houses, <coughs> there's yards to tend to, there's investments, or whatever you're doing, you know, there's a lot of things that seem to need, require attention, and he's like, don't worry about it. My boy will work, and we're just going to work on shifting your perception inward. And Francis, I think you have something <coughs> practical. Um, yeah, someone asked me the similar question about this process. It seems like a very 
you know, like an analysis process that we go through. And I, I know for me, because I had a, a very intellectual mind to start with, so it's almost like this kind of process satisfied that mind and to to somehow rest, allow it to rest in the end, because it almost could not just accept the, the change um, quickly like that without somehow it wants to understand it wants to understand what is underneath it why I feel this way why you know what ex- exactly so it, it took me quite a while I I did use the process the, the chart and the instrument for peace to just allow myself to really go through that process but like David said it is really a process until it becomes an instant you know it in the end healing only takes an instant over the years, what really happened for me is a real recognition, um, like very full recognition in my mind that if there is something going on, it is always because of the desire. And that is not an intellectual understanding. It's not just because it's said in the book or by David. It becomes uh, an understanding over all of this observation and attentiveness put in my mind and in my emotion and in my perception. So when that becomes a clear recognition, then it becomes very quick. So whenever there is something I know for a fact, I desire something else than God, and the prayer becomes a sincere prayer, help me to grow my desire for you, you know, and I don't want to just overlay it. I don't desire it. I must have desired it. That's what I have been calling for and I've experienced. So what is the most genuine prayer I can set in that moment is please help me grow my desire for you and has been like that for me and it's just very, very profound for me to always allow this desire to grow and really bring everything back to the desire. But that is what I feel for someone who actually don't really need all this process to to sort of set up, satisfy this intellectual mind, then you're great. It's really a great place already. If that is the case, really when the emotion comes up and when you t- notice the thoughts um, that is the block or that is the judgment, you can connect, say, yes, help me change my desire, that that's it. And and by the result, you will know whether that is a genuine handing over or not. You know, through by that fruit, you will know them, it's the same. You know, by the fruit of the result, what you experience, you know what, what you're going, you know, what thoughts you're actually holding on in your mind. So... Yeah, I think you have the inspiration. All of us have the inspiration to it will take us just most perfectly into that that still state of mind. Uh, we've been here, and and Jeffrey and Jeff have been taking this back and forth, and then they were talking about this movie amongst the white clouds. And last night, I watched that, and it was basically over in China. First, it starts off the movie. It's a documentary. It just shows. Beijing, and it shows the busyness of thousands and thousands of millions of people, you know, walking in their days, like you, if you were in a big city like that of 20 some million. And then it, it shows the whole documentary is about those that have chosen to live as, as ascetics and monks up in the mountains. So it follows them. He, the main character is, I guess, an American who goes out and he, he asks questions. Where are they? What town? What village? Wh- where can I find these? And the whole movie is about going up into these hermitages. Of these monks have just built these tiny little huts, uh, pretty solid little huts up there, but they've chosen to step away from the busyness of, of the world pursuits and business and family and all those things and and if, then you listen to them it's it's in Chinese, it's Mandarin but it's got the English subtitles I was laughing because sometimes the subtitles flash so fast I couldn't even read I was like, yeah. okay <laughs> alright, alright, alright a lot of them were like, they, their families would say, where are you going? and the families would go up and try to find them and they were like, they were just letting go of, of what we would consider most important things to the ego of human life so that they could start facing their fears, facing their doubts, 
facing their mind, facing the present moment, facing why am I not content? What am I chasing? What am I seeking? You know, it was really good because all of us have that capacity within ourselves. You know, at any instant we could just say to the rat race, mm, no. I'm just, <laughs> just take the scissors out. Rat race, rat race, 20, 30, 40 years. Oh, let's get the scissors, get the knife out. <laughs> we'll try something else. Let's try a hermitage instead. And I did that. I, I was watching the movie and I was thinking of all the hermitages I went to where I would just go out and step away from all kinds of things and bake bread and do gardening. Like We have a garden here. I, I cleared out, cut down trees and and planted things and and grew food and you know got down to the real basics and I had my Course in Miracles book out with me so I was like okay Jesus I'm, I still have a lot of thoughts and beliefs I'm dealing with but I I kind of reduced the my temptations to distractions a little bit seemingly by just moving to the woods and I, I did it a number of different times and ways but still, you don't really reduce the distractions because the thoughts are in your mind. It's not you, the, the location isn't going to do anything. But I, it was just my desire to face whatever I needed to face, to simplify things so I could really face what I had to face. All of us have options available, and the Spirit's there to guide all of us in, in whatever way would be helpful. And it will reach us, the Spirit will reach us in a way that's that's compelling and interesting to us. It's not, the Spirit's not going to bore you to death, uh, because the Spirit wants to wake you up to joy, so the Spirit's not going to suggest things that are so boring that you fall asleep with it. For many people, meditation is just, you know, if they find themselves sleeping <laughs> all the time, there's something the mind goes, no, this is not, this can't be the way Jesus is guiding me to sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep to wake up, you know, sleep all the time. You know, people know that that's not it. So it's there. It's definitely there for us, but we just have to tap into it. I have questions over here. Is it possible when we improve our awareness of our ego and its projections, instead of having another egoic response to that of frustration, disappointment, or resentment of that ego, to just laugh at it with lightness just observe it and just find the whole thing extremely funny ridiculous not only possible, ridiculous. That's, that's inevitable <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is like going, yeah, oh, yeah, that's it that's, that's exactly where this is heading yeah and can I just ask a question of Francis, when we were talking about people pleasing um, and the difference between it doesn't mean don't ever do anything for anyone but it's the intent behind it and the purpose and identifying whether it's a, a divine Holy Spirit derived intent through love or whether it's the people pleasing egoic type of action that you're doing for someone are a couple of red flags that we can look for to identify if it's ego bound and people pleasing um, if it feels like we're settling it might be one by doing that action or um, if we're aware of some sub subconscious secondary gain we might be expecting might be another thing to look out for to see that it's an ego derived action rather than a love derived action I think in the end it's always about how you feel because uh, you know we we were trying this um, expression session group in the morning for everybody to to tap into how to express and also how to listen. And sometimes we have this paired up exercise that's also a very direct way for people to start experiencing. Because when you are um, talking to someone and someone has something for you, that requires your response. You can always tell by how you feel whether this response is coming from a place of trying to please or trying to join in the in the story, or this response is coming from a truly inspired place by how you feel. And in those um, exercises, sometimes we do in in gatherings. Um, 
like in Japan, we did that uh, exercise. We have one person express whatever, and the other person will not respond in any way that um, that is off the norm. Like you don't nod or smile or um, have any gestures, and the only response you have is to quote uh, a sentence from the workbook lesson from A Course in Miracles, and we have everybody quote, I'm the Holy Son of God. And that response, in general, uh, is not directly related to whatever people are expressing, and definitely is not an answer for people's expression or questions or the cries for help in a direct way. And yet, when the experience that everybody has after the exercise is that when that, because that is a true thought, that is a thought that is truth. So when anybody is expressing of their stories um, that comes from the egoic construct, that becomes a problem and concern and the emotional or belief system. And your brother is assuring you or affirming a true thought, whether it's relevant to what you think it is, you know, what you're saying or not, it is so assuring, it actually brings this huge sense of peace and healing to both. That is the, the experience that is very surprising to the people who actually are in the middle of it. But the, the, the result, the experience is convincing. And that is what we were talking about, about no people pleasing. That is just a very tiny example of how to listen and how to respond when people seem to, to join with you. And But that actually can be transferred to all situations when you know someone is talking with you and um, expect something of you or you know when you're in a relationship or in a in a job situation it is also you know how you feel will be a good way to judge where you actually come from you know in in dealing with a friend or a family member it's actually possible to practice that lesson you know imagine if if you have a partnership and there's a lot of conflict that comes up where you just sit down at dinner one night and say, you know, when we get into arguments, it just escalates and it gets worse and worse and worse. So we need, let's try it, some kind of technique to get out of it. And and this technique would be to say, okay, one or the other goes into just a sense of complete acceptance as an exercise and comes into some words that they resonate with in their heart, and they're going to be the presence of love. Well, the argument is going to be gone in that. And people have mystical experiences when we do this kind of diet work, where they go, wow, I've never had an experience like that. Sometimes there will even be couples that will get paired up in a diet, and they'll go, wow, I felt so much love in that exercise. I've never felt that much love with them regularly, but that... Or maybe you feel like you want, you know, you, you're just getting ready to have an argument with somebody and you just picture Jesus coming down and saying, here, we're going to do an exercise now. And I want you to play the presence of love, and this and that. Or maybe even having Jesus, Jesus morph and turn, go inside the person that you're arguing with. And then you, anything that you can use in your mind that helps you bring you out of this idea of that you already know who they are and you already know their problems, and you already know their issues, you know, that I know mind that gets locked up into debating and arguing, it's just not worth it. We're, we're worth peace of mind. We don't need to click back into those old habits. You will get a chance to watch how perfect love casts out fear, you know, in front of your eyes. Because when people are demanding some kind of um, response, they, they're in the wrong mind already because they believe in a story that is not true. They believe in some kind of suffering. And the normal way that the ego handles is to come in, join, and try to find solution at that realm. And then hopefully that there is a temporary fix and a temporary sense of joining. But there isn't really a joining because similar uh, problem will come up another time with another person. It's always going to be endless problems. So when you started to connect in your mind with the spirit, 
and you will see that the ego has nowhere to join. And it, it can even feel a little discomfort because the ego seek and de demand understanding and, and joining in that level. And when there isn't, and you can stay there, there is no way it must disappear. And, and someone there who somehow temporarily mistaken who they are will be able to have something higher to join to when you hold a high note. And that is how healing happens. You know, that is that is so healing for your own mind to witness that and for someone else to be able to link up with that and give an experience. Yeah. In practicality, you know, I I came to Australia seven consecutive years, I think around two thousand four to two thousand eleven and I remember one early on tour that my friend Raj took me down, started up around uh Gold Coast and and came down 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 uh, to Sydney. Then I flew down to to Melbourne. But as we're driving down, I think we were maybe up near Newcastle, someplace along there. We actually got to this point where he was setting up the gatherings. We would have all these people. He would collect donations and do these different things. He started to get so happy traveling with me. He just got happier and happier and happier and they started to get lightheaded and he started to get a, a bit dizzy and w one time we were just he set up for a gathering and and before the people came he just said i it's I, i'm it's getting dysfunctional he said i'm traveling with you and now i'm getting lightheaded and i'm just I'm uh, just getting like, ooh, I'm up, ooh, up in the clouds, and just my mind is just so happy and everything. And I said, so what do you want? And and he said, actually, I need to be grounded. I feel like I'm just, I, I need to be grounded. And I said, okay, very good, let's work on that. I said, what, what do you want to do to be grounded? And he said, if you could just come out to a restaurant with me and have a big steak with me and a bottle of wine, uh, I think that would do it. I said, all right. So we went out and had steak and wine. He went, that's much better. Yeah, now. You know, everybody, you have to be practical. Even in, as you get higher and higher and higher, you know, if you start to feel a bit out of control, then just stop and pause and be practical and, and be intuitive. And that's the fun part of it, you know, the, the Spirit is so, Jesus is so playful, he, Jesus is always working with you with what's, what's practical, never, never trying to take you too fast, too far, never taking you where you're so stretched that you get scared, you know, the, the Spirit's always there with a light-hearted sense of, of humor and, and keep it practical. So that, that was a beautiful experience for me. Keep it real. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, the, uh, the statements, um, who am I, uh, that you were saying, uh, Maharishi was it? Ramana Maharishi. Okay, and know thyself, that's in the Bible. Um, for some reason, they're just scary statements for me. It's like, you know, we're trying to get beyond ourselves. Um, I, I'm not really sure what they mean. I've, I've never really, every time I hear that, I think, oh, goodness, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what they mean. I, I, I'm trying to get beyond myself. I, yeah, lose the ego and the I. Mm. Yeah, it's... It's so, identity is so deeply ingrained that um, those who am I or those know thyself, those statements can, can stir up a, definitely a sense of restlessness for the ego because that's like the core issue and, and the entire world was made so that that issue is not looked at. In other words, it was all made as a distraction from that and then when you start to just to even allow that to come in, it's like, oh, what's, and what's the point of that? And, you know, the, the ego can, can get kind of stirred up even around those things, because that's like a core thing. So it's best to remember that really the prayer of your heart is, is you're saying to the Spirit, just show me the way. You know the way. You provide the guidance. You give me those little prompts and nudges. 
And even if it's going to take me zillions of little steps, little bite-sized steps, I'm not going to gorge myself <laughs> here. I'm going to take it bite-sized by bite-sized step. And to me, that's, that's where the path can be quite gentle and loving. Particularly, that's my, that was my incentive to tune into guidance. Okay, what would you have me do? Just really stay into that. Every day is a blank slate. Every day is an open uh, possibility. And, and what would you have me do? And oftentimes, you know, it, it's like, okay, we're going to the movies. I remember Jesus here, we're going to listen to some music. Okay, and we're going to the movies. Uh, sometimes I feel a little bit, in the early years, like a two o'clock in the afternoon and everybody, I'm thinking everybody's working or everybody's at school or everybody's doing something. I'm in the movie theater at the matinee, you know, going, is this, he's like, relax. We're going to have some fun here. I'm going to talk to you during the movie. We're going to use this. One time I was on a road trip and, and uh, Jesus said, now I want you to go to the video store and, and rent two movies. And I'm like, two movies now? Two movies in the afternoon? He said, yes. And so we go to the video store, and I get uh, I get this movie, Michael Douglas, The Game, yeah. and and Jesus is like there. That's the first movie, and I'll keep going. And uh, where Bill Murray, what Bill Murray, the man who knew too little. So he has me take these two videos home and watch them back to back. The funny thing is, both movies have basically the same theme. Both is a movie about brothers. In both movies, one brother is giving the other brother a gift. And in the game, it was Sean Penn giving Michael Douglas the gift of this recreation thing. And in The Man Who Knew Too Little, it was Peter Gallagher giving Bill Murray the gift of, of like a um, theater comes at you, like what do they call it? A, like a spontaneous theater. Straight yeah, straight theater, theater of life. I think it was called in the movie or whatever, where it is imp improv. It comes at you, and I'm like, hmm, this is like a setup. He's got me watching two movies, and he's got the same themes in both. And I'm like, so I said, okay, are there any more instructions? And he said, yeah, I want you to watch the game first and see how intense it is for Michael Douglas because of his pride. He's like a powerful financier and he's fighting and kicking. The ego is rearing up and he's kicking and fighting the whole way through. In fact, he fights and kicks so much that in one scene, he, he's like, he wakes up and he's like, what? He sees little cracks of light. He's in a coffin. He's been buried alive in Mexico. <laughs> and he's, he's in a coffin. He's kicking the, the dirt's coming down and everything. And then, the second movie is The Man Who Knew Too Little, Bill Murray. And Jesus said, now watch how he handles it. He has such a small self-concept that he is totally gliding through this movie. They're shooting at him. They're trying to poison him. They're trying to strangle him. They're trying to do all the things that they did to Michael Douglas. And Bill Murray is like laughing his way through the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, I see. So he's saying, I want you to live your life like... Bill Murray character. I want you to stay lighthearted, learn to laugh with me at things. In fact, he's so lighthearted that the other people in The Man Who Knew Too Little think that Bill Murray is an American super agent. They say he's, a, he's fearless. You can't strangle him and shoot him. You can't. This is, and at one point, they, they put truth serum. They try to, they get him and they, they, they get him and they tie him up and they put truth serum in him. And they're like, okay, who do you work for? They're trying to see if he's like working for the Russians or the Germans or the Americans or whatever. They give him, and he's like, he's got the truth serum and he's like, no. And they say, who do you work for? Answer the question. Blockbuster video, Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> He, he tells the truth and they go, oh, he is so good. <laughs> but he is telling the truth. <laughs> he, he works with Blockbuster Video 
<laughs> Des Moines, Iowa, and he's come across to England to visit his, his brother. And you see, that's the fun of it. Jesus is like, you can tell the truth, but he's so uninvested in the world that he, even when they're shooting guns and, and things, something flies in his eye. And he goes, hey, hey, watch it there. You know, because he's so sure it's the theater, improv theater, that these are just actors. He's, he's convinced that they're all just actors. Now think of that in your own life. In your own relationships, if you went to visit your mother, for example, and you have all these memories of, oh, my mother, and how it's going to be, and this and this, and you just said, no, this is an act. And then you went there, and your mother put on the act. And you could just watch it and just go, bravo. That's an amazing, guilty mother. Oh, my God. You should get the Academy Award. Instead of... Buying into it and going, oh yeah, yeah, your energy is going down, and you listen for three hours about who's to blame and it's guilty. You're they're all excited, like Oscar, that's an Oscar performance, you know. But it's the it's all in the frame of mind. It's the state of mind. If you can remember, as Bill Murray's character was, that this is all just an act, you could have so much fun with everyone. And in the case of like Michael Douglas, he just. He kept fighting back. He kept believing there were really people out to get him. And he had this powerful, powerful mind. Like, like he thought he was important, a very important man. And nobody gets away from anything. And he was going to fight back. But the harder he fought back, the more vicious that the game got to him until he found himself buried in Mexico. Yes. Um, I really, um I really understand that concept that you're talking about because um, when I think of sort of life as fiction that you talked about before, as soon as you said that, I thought comedy, you know, and um, and I find myself in situations where I am sort of looking at um, something that may be perceived as tragic or sad or another person sharing something and I do see the comedy in it, the comedy that I'm thinking and perceiving that, um, but can I smile or do I hold back and sort of like I can, I can focus in on my true self and, and be in that place and know the, the projection and look from, from that place, but do I need to hold back on that and be um, mindful and careful um, that the people I am perceiving are not understanding where I am? Yeah, it, what I found over the years is, is, as I join with Jesus, He's always appropriate. You know, Jesus will will never have you laughing or smiling um, if if it, if it would in, induce fear. Uh, you can still have this inner happiness and glee and lightness, uh, and it's like. For example, if you went to a, f a funeral, you know, you're not going to be called to go in there and, and act like a stand-up comedian. Uh, if, if people are there and they're grieving and they have a tremendous sense of loss, you are the light of the world, so you will go there and in your state of mind, oftentimes you're there to behold the love and to, to be the love. When my grandmother passed away, um, she came to me and she said that she wanted to speak through me at her own funeral. We, we watched that ultimate gift where it was all on a video, DVD and video. She wanted to do a live performance uh, at her own funeral. So I said, okay. So I actually showed up and, and, and at the service where she was, her body was laid out, I let her speak to the whole group and people started crying because they recognized her presence very strongly and then um, and the woman who was the, the woman who was doing the eulogy the formal eulogy she just came up afterwards and said oh, I wish I had a notebook my god I wish I could have taken notes on all the stuff that that you said it was really her coming through me and then to the cemetery you know she she got she took action she came through me and there was all these flowers that were supposed to be put on her grave and she she loved everybody there that came to the seminaries, cemetery so she had me going out and giving flowers to everybody there and, and they could feel it. It wasn't awkward, they just felt all this love there. It was appropriate. 
um, because they knew her. She was very unconditionally loving and they could feel the presence of love. But you would never be guided to do something that would increase fear uh, for anybody. It would always be appropriate. So that's where you don't want to just practice that connection. Just stay with so that that's connection. The, that's the trust. Yes, the trust. that's the trust. It's going to be appropriate and letting yourself go to the spirit and completely trust the spirit. You're never going to be appropriate, inappropriate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little quick story. Twenty years ago, or thereabouts, I went to a funeral of a friend, and something that stayed with me. There was a lot of distress because the man was quite young when he died. Um, and everyone was very sad, except for this one woman, young woman, who apparently I asked, found out later was his cousin who'd flown over from the United States. And she was a little bit further down the, um, down the aisle and on the opposite side. So I could see her clearly because I was on the edge of the aisle. And I was just drawn to her. I was still listening to the eulogy and the sermon and everything. But she was sitting there. She wasn't sad. She had the most unbelievable, peaceful, serene, calm, happy, not giggly happy, but just this tiny smile, this gift of peace. And she was she was just sitting there with this stillness. And as um, he was taken out in the coffin at the end, she just watched him. And it was like she was just projecting this love. It was radiating like a beacon from her. I'm sure I'm not the only one in the church that noticed, but I just thought, oh my God, I actually found it very soothing and comforting in my own sadness of losing this friend. It was such a gift, and she was like that at the graveside as well, and it was so special, and I just thought, I want what she's got. It was just beautiful. It was You couldn't describe it with words. I will never forget that. And so that was an appropriate expression of that. Even though she was smiling, it was an appropriate smile and no one took offence I don't think it was just incredible beautiful thank you that's a perfect example of that being true in true empathy which is one of our topics stay in true empathy but also let the gentleness of the spirit come through and and be a beacon of light yeah I just remember this uh, one incident in China um, a few weeks ago when I we finished this uh, Gathering, and we had a young man who, who was um, joining with us from another city, and he was waited. He was waiting for having a time to join with us, and and the whole, throughout the whole time, we didn't have time until the the day he was going to leave. We finished the whole thing. He was going to fly back to this home city, and he said, "Can we, can we talk? I have so much I need to." I cry every night, and I said, "Okay, let's spend some time." So we. Sp- we sat together and just he just threw out all his dark thoughts and he feels this intense things and, and it was very dark and he was just crying and all that I heard because I was listening to the spirit, not really to him because I was thinking this is really a human condition that he was describing, not him. So I was listening to the spirit and all the spirit is that is put your feet on his lap. And I thought, <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I took my shoes off and I was like, that's, uh, take my feet and I just stick my feet on his lap. And I, obedience to follow. <laughs> Put your feet on his lap. <laughs> and I, I didn't know because he didn't give me instruction of what to say, whether I have to say something. I just said, I'm, I'm just going to uh, do this. <laughs> And he just like, oh my God, oh my God, thank you so much, thank you so much. That's my prayer. I just so want to hold your feet before I leave. I was praying to Jesus for days. Thank you so much. And he just forgot everything he was expressing and just burst into tears of gratitude. And that's how we parted. I and I had I wouldn't have any clue of how to respond in that moment, you know. And that is, told me about that. She said, yeah, I did. I, I couldn't. I thought, okay. And then she did it, and, and the reflection came immediately back to you. Immediately. And, and that was the only thing that he really wanted to say, but he, he, he couldn't say that. So it was all this expression of darkness. But when that 
like a solution came, he just like, thank you so much, thank you spirit, thank you so much. You know, that was a beautiful joining to end the whole, the whole encounter. That's Jesus. <laughs> okay, well I guess it's about noon here, that's the perfect, <laughs> perfect one to end on. <laughs> Yeah. for the day. So, Sue, do you have any um, logistics? Um, uh, the first one is that there's a little bit of lost property gathering, and it's out on the box next to the whiteboard. So if you've lost um, socks, <laughs> hats, <laughs> it's out there. And there might even be a couple of books, too. And uh, also that this afternoon we're going to do an experiential at 3 o'clock in here. And people are very welcome if you're in process or you're just feeling the call to walk or just be with yourself to do that. Take that opportunity. It's not... uh, It's all optional. So if you don't feel to come, please don't. (laughs) Honour yourself. And last of all... Uh, in the morning when we come to our groups, our expression session groups, if you just come a few minutes before and just settle in and just tune into the spirit, call him into the group and be aware of other groups setting up as well um, and not pass through the hall or the parlour if the group has already started. It's a, it's a little bit distracting when someone's dropping into their feelings. So you can always come this way if you're going to the hall or even come in through that other uh, bathroom entrance there. Yeah, we have our group here, so... Well, there's another group in the hall. Ideally, come early. <laughs> right, oh, to get to the hall. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of courage sometimes for people that are just getting in touch with some intense emotions. And if these emotions have been pushed down for a long time and they're just allowing them up, it's almost like a cocoon. You know, you wouldn't go and stick a stick in the middle of a cocoon or something. You, emotionally, it's a, it's a really precious time. And it's, it's like turning the tables on a very deep pattern of saying, I'm going to allow myself to feel these feelings and get in touch with them. And so if people start coming in and walking in towards another group or trying to hurry to do that after the groups have already begun, begun it's almost like you may think of them as like little sacred spaces where there's a healing going on there. You don't want to step in in the middle of it. That's, that's really the intention yeah. behind it. Yeah. And just to be clear, if you are trying to get to the hall, you can come through this door on the veranda and slip in that way. But it would be best if you get there on time because we've got a group out on that veranda too. (laughs) So, yeah. Yes, yes, there is. And that door doesn't close very easily, so you'll have to be aware of that too. Okay. Thank you. And we'll see it probably, we might have a movie tonight, but we'll just kind of feel into all the, which, I know, if there's so many options, we will just pray and, and tune into one that will be very helpful for what issues are arising for us here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good, it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Enjoy your lunch too. Yeah. Someone's wanting to sing. Is that To sing. Okay. Yeah. This is a good time. You do you need a microphone or just want to sing? No. Um. I was gonna. Um. My favorite movie is uh. Wizard of Oz. And I wanted to sing Over the Rainbow, and I know it's about yearning, but at, at the end of the moment she actually realises that it was always there. So it's that song's on. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful.